No, seriously, did we did we get into the third last trip? We got we to the not the last time. All right, first jump into the third time. All right. We, we did. Barbara. <laughs> Didn't we do three the week before? Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right. Now we go to four. Yeah. Right. No, no. Thank you, Barb. Just for that, you can start reading. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we the second time, I remember, may have been very faulty on that issue. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't even finish three. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. We did part. We did two. Part of two. Right all the way. No, we did time. two. The first time. time. We went skip two. Yeah, the first, first time, time we went to three. We've done two. We've done one twice. And we've done three once, and we've done two once. There, say so there's the authority. Well, then we should start from? Four. Two. Four. All right, Barbara, why don't you start then, since you were so smart. No. <laughs> After this all-perfect comprehension of the first theory. Wait, where are you starting? Four. Yeah. Four. 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 All eyes move. Okay. After this all perfect comprehension of the first theory, we must deliver the modes according to which Plato teaches us mystic conceptions of divine natures. For he appears not to have pursued everywhere the same mode of doctrine about these, but sometimes according to a deific energy, and other times and at other times dialectically. He evolves the truth concerning them. Hmm, let me try that one more time. Yeah. For he appears not to have pursued everywhere the same mode of doctrine about these, but sometimes according to a deific energy, and at other times dialectically, he evolves the truth concerning them. And sometimes he symbolically announces their ineffable <coughs> peculiarities, but at other times he recurs to them from images and discovers in them the primary causes of holes. For in the Phaedrus, being inspired by the nymphs and having exchanged human intelligence for a better possession, fury, he unfolds with a divine mouth many arcane dogmas concerning the intellectual gods and many concerning the liberated rulers of the universe, who lead upwards the multitude of mundane gods to the monads, which are intelligible and separate from mundane holes. What does he mean by mundane? He used that word before, mundane, the super mundane. <laughs> Encourage me. Encourage me? He asked you a question. He asked me a question? Yes, yes. 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 <laughs> I was trying to avoid it by all that, but what's mundane? Earthly. There. Will you accept that? Well said. <laughs> Close. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> hmm. I'm really interested to see who these guys are, the liberated rulers of the universe. They were in a Star Trek Monday. episode. Right? <laughs> they were? <laughs> <laughs> Last night. They had that ugly ship, didn't they? <laughs> oh, you watched that ugly ship? <laughs> <laughs> like that with the funny eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I like this pet dog. So I want to try that sentence up for Yes. For in the Phaedrus, being inspired by the nymphs and having exchanged human intelligence for a better oh. possession, fury, he unfolds with a divine mouth many arcane dogmas concerning the intellectual gods and many concerning the liberated rulers of the universe who lead upwards the multitude of mundane gods to the monads, which are intelligible and separate from mundane wholes. But relating still more about those gods who are allotted the world, he celebrates their intellections and mundane fabrications, their unpolluted providence and government of souls, and whatever else Socrates delivers entheactically, or according to a divinely inspired energy in that dialogue. In that dialogue, as he clearly asserts, ascribing at the same time this fury to the de de deities of the plague. But in the Sophista, dialectically contending about being and the separate hypostasis of the one from being, and doubting against those more ancient than himself, 
He shows how all beings are suspended from their cause and the first being, from, from their cause and the first being. But that being itself participates of the unity which is exempt from the whole of things. That it is a passive one, but not the one itself, being subject to and united to the one, but not being that which is primarily one. I, mean, it's one. I was yeah, just about just, going to go back over It's one, but it's not the one. <laughs> it's the one that is, not the one that isn't. In that case, Bill, what are you mean? <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> then I'll follow. <laughs> um, I just thought you might give it a better emphasis, you know? But <laughs> Pierre! You've well, often been known to give good emphasis. <laughs> What are you trying <coughs> This sentence. This reading. Just as much as you're willing to do. Yeah, that's the reading? Yeah. It's not <laughs> and then if I have any trouble, I'll ask you for that. I mean, anyone that feeds me caviar and feta cheese with lemons, with lime juice, lime juice, lime juice. Lemons, yeah. God, that's all right. But in a sophist, dialectically contending about being and the separate hypostases of the one from beings, and doubting against those more ancient than themselves, he shows how all beings are suspended from their cause and the first being, but that being itself participates of the unity which is exempt from the whole of things, that it is a passive one, but not the one itself, being subject to and united to the one, but not being that which is primarily one. That last phrase. What one are they talking about? But not being that which is primarily it's not that. <laughs> the king and queen of heaven. It's the one of the one being in the second hypothesis. Right. Uh -huh. mm. Which is two. Not one. Mm -hmm. It's a participating one. Participating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go stubborn answer for that one. Seek and you shall find. Is there a problem with that? Is there some reason why we stop? No. In a sim I well there's a one from beings. Right? It shows all beings are suspended from their cause. So the cause of that one which includes beings. And in that class of beings, there's the first being. But that being itself participates of the unity which is exempt from the whole of things. It's not the one itself. It's subject to and united to the one. But not being that which is primarily one. Yeah. Subject to and united to the one. Therefore it participates in the one. Yeah. But it's not it's not being that which is primarily one. It's not a pure one. Mm -hmm. it's basically all being, being itself, and then the one. All beings. 
in the class of all beings there is being by the mind. What does it mean the hyperspace of the statement? One from B. No, no. I don't understand that. Hypostasis is a, you can take that to be a hypothesis at this moment. So, it's a principle upon which you stand. And where are you, Karen? That all, that all beings are the category that includes being itself. Yes. Beings plural. And the class. Beings. In the class of beings, there is being. In all beings, there is being. Since means the being itself, and mm -hmm. being as such transcends a class called all beings. That's right. There's a class and there's members of the class. Yes. Yeah. And the class would be called being. Mm -hmm. And all beings are in that class. That's right. So all beings are in the class. All, yes, all beings happen to be in a class called All beings. Being. Okay. Yeah. Straight now. In a similar <laughs> manner, too, in the Parmenides. I was going to say, but when that section, but not being that which is primarily one. I get, uh, it, you can read that, or I, I started reading that it's, the one itself can be considered to have being, because he's making distinctions other than that, so I don't know if that, it sounds like that may not be correctly translated. I don't see it, you know, go back to that it is a passive one, and read from there. That it is a passive one, but not the one itself, being subject to and united to the one. Uh -huh. But not being that one, which is primarily one. Sorry, they're all negatives. Yeah. But wait, <laughs> describing. That, but I'm, am I emphasizing that statement correctly? Mm -hmm. But not being that which is well, primarily. Well, don't make the B in your capital B. Okay, now that's what I'm wondering how to say that. Well, yeah, that's not a noun. Not not being. Being. Yeah, it's not a noun. Being. But. <coughs> so it's not the primary one. Right. Mm -hmm. If I eliminate the word being in that. You, you'd need, but it is not the being which is primarily one. But it's not being itself which is primary. You'd need a different structure is what they're telling you for it to be being itself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't function as, as being itself in this, in this clause. Mm -hmm. That's a verb, which um, that it is a passive, that it, um, it's being subject to. It's a participle in the same way as being subject to. Seeing being subject to and being united and not being. Those are all in the chain. Well, right. See that, Jesus? Mm -hmm. I don't have any problem up until that comma. I'm just wondering how you emphasize where the being goes in that one sentence. And if it goes one way, then I can see it going to the one itself. If you emphasize it differently, then it can go to the passive one. I mean, it... But you do see that's not being itself, but that, that is a participle? Or you don't see that? No, that's what I was seeing. I didn't understand how you talk about that being in that being. sentence. Okay, do you see that you'd need a verb there? A yeah. different kind of a structure? It wouldn't work that way. To have for it to be being itself? See that, I don't know, this may not help. Can I just try one sure. thing? Look at the sentence where it says, but that being itself participates. See that? It's three lines above it. Yeah. But that being itself participates, see it? One, two, three, four lines above where you are. But that being itself, itself participates. Okay. See that you have a being participates. It's functioning as a subject. Okay. Okay? But you don't have that structure here. You right. don't have it can't a be a noun. It's a verb in there, right? <coughs> well, the way of, another way of my putting it is, but take the expression, but not being, could we not 
we phrase that as is, right. but is not. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it that is not. Is primarily. Right. It is not, which is primarily one. Right. Not being not. Being yeah. Not. yeah. Is is the same. Okay. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If it's read that way, I can understand it. It fits with what was said before. Okay. In a similar manner. In a similar manner, too, in the Parmenides, he unfolds dialectically the progressions of being from the one and the transcendency of the one through the first hypothesis. And this, as he asserts in that dialogue, according to the most perfect division of this method. And again in the Gorgias, he, rel he relates the fable concerning the three demiurgi, or fabricators, and their demiurgic allotment, which indeed is not only a fable, but a true narration. But in the banquet, he speaks concerning the union of love, and in the Protagoras about the distribution of mortal animals from the gods in a symbolical manner, concealing the truth respecting divine natures. And as far as to mere indication, unfolding his mind to the most genuine of his hearers. If likewise you are willing that I should mention the doctrine delivered through the mathematical disciplines and the discussion of divine concerns from ethical or physical discourses, of which many may be contemplated in the Timaeus, many in the dialogue called the Politicus, and many, many may, be see scattered, may be seen scattered in other dialogues. Here likewise to you who are desirous of knowing design, divine concerns through images, the method will be apparent. For all, those, for all these shadow forth the power of things divine, the politicus, for example, for the political, for instance, the fabrication in the heavens. But the figures of the five elements delivered in geometrical proportions in the Timaeus represent in images the peculiarities of the gods who ride on the parts of the universe. And the divisions of the, physic, of the psychical essence in the dialogue shadow forth the total orders of the gods. I omit to mention that Plato composes polity, <coughs> assimilating them to divine nature and to the whole world, and adorns them from the powers which it contains. All these, therefore, through the similitude of mortal to divine concerns, exhibit to us in images the progressions, orders, and fabrications of divine natures, and such are the modes of theologic doctrine employed by Plato. It is evident, however, from what has already been said. But does anybody have a question so far? I've just been kind of charging on. Well, it just shows shows the way he reads the dialogue. Sure does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Mm -hmm. About the psychic. <coughs> He's got them all classified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, divisions of psychical essence. That's what I thought. Oh, uh, what are those divisions of psychical essence? Mm -hmm. The total orders of the gods. Here, I'll sell you a book for a You will. I know you will. What? You'll unfold his that understanding of that all as we go along. Okay. Right. Okay, thanks, Bob. Yeah. I have a. Hmm. You addressing it to me? Oh, only. He was saying. Glad to hear. Glad, glad you were. Because I heard someone volunteer. All right. To my right. I don't know Shoot. whether you guys heard it. I didn't hear anything. Can't hear that? That's pretty good. The point of this one. Oh, he forgot. Oh. It. Hmm? Must have been a mere opinion. <laughs> Bill was making the point that he enjoyed seeing the psychical essence in that dialogue and shadow forth the total order of the gods, and you responded by saying, Okay. When Paul asked in response to that, to for some kind of clarification of that, mm -hmm. you offered one. Remember? Oh, it's not Yeah, I thought one. I thought I was saying, uh, okay. this is not the time connection for that. Oh, then you're making the same, Ron made the point that that yeah. point's clarified further in the text, so we both agree. They're not mentioned, uh, he doesn't mention these. Yeah, it's a promise. Yeah. yeah. So it's a claim. Mm -hmm. So, so we'll, 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 I could turn it in. 
We'll call that PC. Paul's claim. Oh. Right. Paul's claim. Fair? Claim? Yeah, for the train ticket for a later. Oh, party. okay, that kind of claim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Claim okay. ticket. <laughs> oh, I see. You claim all. Let's take your claim. Good yeah. idea. Sure. Yeah. It is evident, however, from what has been already said, that they are necessarily so many in number. For those who treat of divine concerns in an indicative manner, either speak symbolically and fabulously, or through images. But of those who openly announce their conception, some frame their discourses according to science, but others according to inspiration from the gods. And he who, desi he who desires to signify divine concerns through symbols is orphic, and in short, accords with those who write fables concerning the gods. But he who does this through images is Pyth Pythagoric, for the mathematical disciplines were invented by the Pyth Pythagoreans in order to a reminiscence of divine concerns, at which, through these as images, they endeavor to arrive. For they refer both numbers and figures to the gods, according to the testimony of their historians. But the entheastic character, or he who is under the influence of divine inspiration, unfolding the truth itself, by itself, concerning the gods, most perspicuously, perspicuously ranks among the highest initiators. Clearly. Clearly. Most clearly right. Uh, but the enthusiastic character, or he who is under the influence of divine inspiration, unfolding the truth itself by itself concerning the gods, most clearly ranks among the highest initiated. For these who do not think proper to unfold the divine orders, or their peculiarities to their familiars through certain veils, but announce their powers and their numbers in consequence of being moved by the gods themselves. For th try that again. For these do not think proper to, to unfold the divine orders or their peculiarities to their familiars through certain veils, but announce their powers and their numbers in consequence of being moved by the gods themselves. But the tradition of divine concerns, according to science, is the illustrious prerogative of the philosophy of Plato. For Plato alone, as it appears to me, of all those who are known to us, has attempted metho methodically to divide and reduce into order the regular progression of the divine genera, their mutual difference, the common peculiarities of the total orders, and the distributed peculiarities in each. But the truth of this will be evident when we frame precedaneous demonstrations about the Parmenides and all the divisions which it contains. simple words. Uh, that took a long wet, that took a long trip, lovely as it was, to pray. Beautiful place, isn't it? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. The root root I've never seen before. <laughs> I know. Chris 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 next time you're at a party, probably. Precedent. Precedent. Yeah, I don't know what I mean. Like Precedent. Precedent. Yeah, that, that was no idea. The next time That's you train a precedaneous demonstration, I wonder what this looks like in Greek. Make sure you're infused in the enthusiasm. It's just your enthusiasm. Yeah, what was that enthusiasm? It's a little deity in it. Your enthusiasm. Are you ecstasis? It's complicated. It's interesting. All right. I don't even use press hey, Good, good. Boy, oh, we're going tonight. Uh, <laughs> sometimes evidence. Is this because we're really on our way to five? <laughs> <laughs> At present, we shall observe that Plato does not admit all the fabulous pigments of dramatic composition, but only those which have reference to the beautiful and the good, and which are not discordant with a divine essence. For that mythological mode which indicates divine concerns to conjecture is ancient, concealing truth under a multitude of veils and proceeding in a manner similar to nature, which extends sensible figments of intelligibles, material of immaterial, partible 
of imparticle natures and images and things which have a false being of things perfectly true. But Plato rejects the more tragical mode of myth mytho mythologizing of the ancient poet. Mythologizing, thank you, of the ancient poets who thought proper to establish an arcane theology respecting the gods, and on this account devised wanderings, sections, battles, lacerations, rapes, and adulteries of the gods, and many other such symbols of the truth about divine natures which this theology conceals. This mode he rejects and asserts that it is in every respect most foreign from erudition. But he considers those mythological discourses about the gods as more persuasive and more adapted to truth and the philosophic habit which assert that a divine nature is the cause of all good but of no evil, and that it is void of all mutation, ever preserving its own order immutable and comprehending in itself the fountain of truth, but never becoming the cause of any deception to others. For such types of theology, Socrates, Socrates delivers in the Republic. Yep, yeah, sure enough. <coughs> All the fables, therefore, of Plato, guarding the truth and concealment, have not even their externally apparent appara apparatus discordant with our undisciplined and unperverted anticipation respecting the gods. One more time. Yeah. All the fables, therefore, of Plato, guarding the truth and concealment, have not even their externally apparent apparatus discordant with our undisciplined and unperverted anticipation. <laughs> this is really a nice idea. I just can't read. You know, it, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. You, you like external apparatus. Right? Well, I know I like them. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, yeah. It's got a great phrase, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but it's not discordant. <laughs> That's the main idea. <laughs> <laughs> One hell of a sentence, I'll tell you. <laughs> All the fables, therefore, of Plato, guarding the truth and concealment, have not even their externally apparent apparatus discordant with our undisciplined and unperverted anticipation respecting the God. Even the veil is spontaneous it. and pure. Well, their modes are, that's, that's their that's modes are appropriate. Even the veil itself is not discordant. Right, right. Compared to what we do, it's undisciplined and unperverted. Unperverted? That doesn't go with unperverted. Not disciplined and unperverted. One has no discipline, maybe perverted. But they bring with them an image of the mundane composition in which both the apparent beauty is worthy of di divinity and a beauty more divine than this is established in the unapparent lives and powers of the gods. Why do you say that in truth? This, therefore, is what... But they bring with them an image of the mundane composition in which both the apparent beauty is worthy of divinity and a beauty more divine than this is established in the unapparent lives and powers of the gods. Model copy. The beauty is divine. This, therefore, is one of the mythological modes respecting divine concerns from which the apparently unlawful, irrational, and in inordinate passes into order and bounds and regards as a scope the composition of the beautiful and the good. Beautiful and good. But there is another mode which he delivers in the favors, and this consists in everywhere preserving theological fables, unmixed with physical narrations and being careful in no respect to confound or exchange theology and the physical theory with each other. For as a divine essence is separate from the whole of nature, in like manner it is perfectly proper that discourses respecting the God should be pure from the physical disquisitions. For a mixture of this kind, says he, 
is, says he, laborious, and to make physical passions the end of mythological conjecture is the employment of no very good man. Such, for instance, as considering through his pretended wisdom, chimera, gorgon, and things of a similar kind, as the same with physical figments. Socrates in the Phaedrus, reprobating this mode of mythologi mythologizing, mythologizing, represents its patrons as saying, under the figure of a fable, that Orithia, sporting with the wind Boreas and being thrown down from the rocks, means nothing more than that Orithia, who was a mortal, was ravished by Boreas through love. For it appears to me that fabulous narrations about the gods should always have their concealed meaning more venerable than the apparent so that if certain persons introduce us, to physical, introduce to us physical hypotheses of platonic fables, and such as are conversant with subluminary affairs, we must say that they are entirely wander from the intention of the philosophers, and that those hypotheses alone are interpreters of the truth contained in these fables, which have for their scope a divine, immaterial, and separate hypothesis and which look into this, makes the compositions and analyses of fables adapted to our inherent anticipations of divine concerns. Wow. This is what he has to demonstrate. <laughs> this is what he's laying out. I'm going to be doing it for a couple of more chapters. Chapter 5 needs to pass onward to someone else. Oh, the volunteers. Volunteers, volunteers, volunteers. You're going to do it? Who's going to do it? Carol's going to do it? She's nodding, she's nodding. Did someone else volunteer I didn't see? Oh, no, Robert said he volunteer. He did? I heard it from here. Oh, wow. I heard it too. Who did? Yeah. Rhonda. Who? Robert. 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 Yeah. Robert. My ears. <laughs> I'm sitting so close he to he Robert. Any, he hasn't Robert worked since he had a pizza and beer. <laughs> oh, then it's good for him. Uh, it, he'll be the, in the best position to read with pizza and beer. Sure. I often have been myself. As we have therefore enumerated <laughs> all these modes of the Platonic theology, and have shown what compositions and analysis of fables are adapted to the truth respecting the gods, let us consider in the next place whence and from what dialogues principally we think the dogmas of Plato concerning the gods may be collected, and by a speculation of what types or forms we may be able to distinguish his genuine writings from those spurious compositions which are ascribed to him. The truth then concerning the gods pervades, as I may say, through all the Platonic dialogues, and in all of them, conceptions of the first philosophy, venerable, clear, and supernatural, are disseminated in some indeed more obscurely, but in others more conspicuously. Conceptions which excite those that are in any respect able to participate in them, to the immaterial and separate essence of the gods. And as in each part of the universe, and in nature herself, the demiurges of all that the world contains established resemblances of the unknown hyparxis of the gods that all things might be converted to a divine nature through their alliance with it. In, the, in like manner, I am of opinion that the divine intellect of Plato weaves conceptions about the gods in all his writings and leaves nothing deprived of the mention of divinity that from the whole of them a reminiscence of wholes may be obtained by any lover of divine concerns. Wow. If, however, it be requisite to lay before the reader those dialogues out of many, which principally unfold to us the mystic discipline about the gods, I should not err in ranking among these, this number the Phaedo and Phaedrus, the Banquet and the Philebus, and together with these the Sophist and Politicus, the Critolus and the Timaeus. For all these are full through the whole of themselves, as I may say, of the divine science of Plato. But I should place in the second rank after these the fable in the Gorgias and that in the Protagoras, likewise the assertion about the providence of the gods and the laws, 
and such things as are delivered about the fates, or the mother of the fates, or the circulations of the universe in the tenth book of the Republic. Again you may, if you please, place in the third rank of those epistles, though which, though which we may be able to ro- arrive at the science about divine natures. For in these, for in these, mention is made of the three kings and every many, and very many other divine dogmas worthy, the, worthy the Platonic theory are delivered. Oh, worthy of it. It is necessary, therefore, looking to these, to explore in these each order of the gods. Thus, from the Philebus, we may receive the science respecting the one good, and the and the two first principles of these, of things, together with the triad which is unfolded into light from these. For you will find all these distinctly delivered to us by Plato in the dialogue. But from the Timaeus you may obtain the theory about intelligibles, a divine narration about the demiurgic monad, and the most full, and the most full truth about the mundane gods. But from the Phaedrus you may acquire a scientific knowledge of all the intelligible and intellectual genre and of the liberated orders of gods which are approximately established above the celestial cir- circulations. From the Politicus you may obtain the theory of the fabrication in the heavens of the uneven periods of the universe and of the intellectual causes of those periods. But from the, f- but from the sophist, the whole sublunar- sublunary generation and the peculiarity of the gods who are allotted the sublunary sublunar- sublunar- <laughs> region and, and preside over its generations and corruptions. But with, but with respect to each of the gods, we may obtain many conceptions adapted to sacred concerns from the banquet, many from the Cratylus, and many from the Phaedo. For in each of these dialogues, more or less mention is made of divine names, from which it is easy for those who are exercised in divine concerns to discover by a reasoning process the peculiarities of each. It is necessary, however, to evince that each of the dogmas accords with Platonic principles and the mystic traditions of the theologists. For all the Grecian theology is the progeny of the mystic tradition of Orpheus. Pythagoras, first of all, learning from Aglap. Aglophemus, Aglophemus, the orgies of the gods, but Plato in the second place, receiving an all-perfect science of the divinities from the Pythagoric and Orphic writings, for in the Philebus, referring the theory about the two species of principles, bound in infinity, to the Pythagoreans, he calls them men dwelling with, with the gods and truly blessed. Philolus, Therefore, the Pythagorean has left us in many, left us in writing many admirable conceptions about these principles, celebrating their common progression into beings and their separate fabrication of things. But in the Timaeus, Plato endeavoring to teach us about the sublun- sub- sublunary. sublunary gods and their order, flies to theologists, calls them the sons of the gods and makes them the fathers of the truth about those divinities. And lastly, he delivers the orders of the sublun- su- sub- sublunary gods proceeding from holes according to the progression delivered by them of the intellectual kings. Again in the Cratylus, he follows the tradition of theologists respecting the order of the divine processions. But in the Gorgias, he adopts the Homeric dogma respecting the triadic hypostasis hypostasis of the demiurge and in short and in short he ev- and in short he everywhere discourses concerning the gods agreeably to the principles of theologists rejecting indeed the tragical part of the mythological fiction but establishing first hypotheses in common with the authors of fables Still 
to go for another one? Sure. Perhaps, however, some someone may here object to us that we do not in a proper manner exhibit the everywhere dispersed theology of Plato, and that we endeavor to heap together different particulars from different dialogues, as if we were studious of collecting together many things into one mixture, instead of deriving them all from one and the same fountain. For if this were the case, we might refer different dogmas to different treaties, treaties of Plato. But we shall by no means have a <laughs> precedaneous pres- mm-hmm. doctrine concerning the gods. Did anyone say what that meant? Clear, wasn't it? Yeah. But that was yeah. per- that was perspicuity. Well, yeah, perspicuity. Well, this is that clear too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's use that. That like maybe be preceding in some way, like or or presumption, or like no. bursting forth clearly. Yeah. Oh, just sort of like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah I get that feeling. So like yeah. Precedent, having a presumption. That's what it sounds like. That's <laughs> precedent. Did you put your dictionary away? Right? It's so yeah. obvious. First, fourth, <laughs> clearly, but <laughs> but <laughs> they don't want to lay odds of whether it's in the dictionary or not. <laughs> yeah, I looked up one of these like that. You need the OED. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. English dictionary. Oh, the Oxford, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wouldn't buy standard American. <laughs> <laughs> I thought clear was a good word for that. <laughs> because you wouldn't have a clear doctrine if you did all that other stuff. If you took something from each one. It's like it precedes it. But we it's got to be something to do with the precedent. Preceding doctrine concerning the doctrine. Yeah, we wouldn't have a fundamental doctrine. That's a good idea. A model. A model. Yeah, we wouldn't have a complete. A fundamental in the sense of first. I'll lay out have something to do with the model. The true model. Yeah, true the model. model. Fundamental model. <laughs> well, that alone is sufficient reason to hate on the thing. New Greek sounds like. Would it be something yeah. like precedent? Yes. Yeah. 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 First. Setting, first. 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 Setting the precedent. But no means have a precedentious doctrine. You wouldn't have a whole well, and complete religion. first doctrine. You think. You'd have pieces. Did you look it up? Yes, I couldn't find it in the dictionary. You were all surprised, right? <laughs> okay. For if this were the case, we might refer different dogmas to different treaties of, treaties of Plato. But we shall by no means have a precedaneous doctrine concerning the gods, nor will there be any dialogue which presents us with an all-perfect and entire procession of the divine genre, and their coordination with each other. But we shall be similar to those who endeavor to obtain a whole from parts, through the want of a whole prior to parts, and to weave together the perfect from the things imperfect. When, on the contrary, the imperfect ought to have the first cause of its generation in the perfect. For the Timaeus, for instance, will teach us the theory of the intelligible genre, and the Phaedrus appears to pre- present us with a metho- methodical account of the first intellectual orders. But where will be the coordination of intellectuals to intelligibles? And what will be the generation of second from first natures? In short, after what manner the progression of the divine orders takes place from the one principle of all things, and how in the generations of the gods the orders between the one and all perfect number are filled up, we shall be unable to evince. Uh Oh, he's he's not going to be able to do that? Farther still, it may be said, where will be the venerableness of your boasted science about divine natures? For it is absurd to call these dogmas which are collected from many places platonic, and which, as you acknowledge, are introduced from foreign names to the philosophy of Plato, nor are you able to evince one whole entire truth about divine natures. Perhaps, indeed, they will say, certain persons, junior to Plato, have delivered in their writings and left to their disciples one perfect form of theology. You therefore are able to produce one entire theory about nature from the Timaeus, but from the Republic or laws, the most beautiful dogmas about manners, 
and which tend to one form of philosophy. Alone, therefore, neglecting the treaties of Plato, which contain all the good of the first philosophy, and which may be called the summit of the whole theory, you will be deprived of the most perfect knowledge of beings, unless you are so much infatuated as to boast on account of fabulous fictions through an analysis of things of this kind abounds with much of the probable but not of the demonstrative. Besides things of this kind are only delivered adventitiously in the Platonic dialogues of the fable does it say A? As. Oh, as the fable in the Protagoras, which is inserted for the sake of the, polit of the political science and the, dem and the demonstrations respecting it. In like manner, the fable in the Republic is inserted for the sake of justice, but in the Gorgias for the sake of temperance. For Plato combines fabulous narrations with investigations of ethical dogmas, not for the sake of the fables, but for the sake of the leading design, that we may not only exercise the intellectual part of the soul through contending reasons, but that the divine part of the soul may more perfectly receive the knowledge of beings through its sympathy with the more mystic concerns. For from other discourses we appear similar to those who are compelled to the reception of truth, but from fables we suffer in an ineffable manner and call forth over unperverted conceptions, venerating the mystic information which they contain. <coughs> Hence, as it appears to me, Timaeus, with great propriety, thinks it fit that we should produce the divine genre following the as the sons of gods and subscribe to their always generating secondary natures from such as are first, though they should speak without demonstration. For this kind of discourse is not demonstrative but enthusiastic, and was invented by the ancients, not through necessity, but for the sake of persuasion, not regarding mere discipline, but sympathy with things themselves. Would you agree we can go through this now and we can collect <coughs> his views on each one of these dialogues as well as others and on the epistles? Can we not? Mm -hmm. Okay, look at it. We need a couple of fast reasons. Why don't we ask people to be responsible for at least one of these dialogues so that they can view it in terms of what Proclus is saying, whether they can see that particular dialogue and the scope with which Proclus presents. Oh. And occasionally, and occasionally we'll be asked to the tenth book. Right. To make a statement in respect to that, whether or not they can see it in view of what he has been saying, and therefore whether his view can be confirmed. You were offering the Republic. We'll take the Republic. And by the way, more than one person can take one. I don't mean. I'll take three. Five levers. What? Who? You, right. Tim, Timmy Ayers, or something like that? Time is? I think a lot of it is that one. No, I don't think that one.
Kratos? Come on, we even did that. <coughs> Bank that's anonymous with some posing? Yes. That's yours. <laughs> good, good. Jack, good. Thank you. Ron, which one's yours? Choose yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> Fatal. Fatal. I got it. You got it. Carol, which one's yours? Which one do you take? <laughs> I like that spirit. You can do it. Oh, I can do any of them I want. Command. Rob, I need to take the sophist. Oh, Good idea. Good idea. Good idea. Good idea. I mean, it doesn't quite make Good sense to. Well, there. I don't know. Is he right on that one? So, you know, he she has a good. very interesting view of the sophist. I mean, it's, yeah. You know, it, he doesn't focus on the statistical element in the sophist. He goes all. to that He's one pulling spot. out a, that's right. uh, a consistent uh, a theology that's consistent with yeah. how he understands all of Plato from it. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was wondering. I that abstraction, I can't argue. You know. Yeah. I want to try? I'll follow through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sarah? Um, Crowless doesn't take me. You're on. Carolyn? Which dialogue do you favor? Parmenides. Coach. And is there anything left? Well, it's multiple. Statesman. Okay. Time is. Time is. Who's got it? You do. Ruth. I already have them. Oh. The Jesus is up there too. Where's that? Which, Which one did Mark say? <laughs> <The time laughs> Which one? I, I didn't hear him. Which one did Mark say? That's amazing. <laughs> 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 Which one did you say? <laughs> <laughs> and now somebody else seems to know. That's all right. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> or was it the Gorgias? The Gorgias. Why don't you take the Gorgias and the Protagoras together? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I don't think that's Being fair. second level. <laughs> Yeah, they're only saying. Uh -huh. Kang has to help me out. Kang, which one? Well, he suggests that I should have him one needed to go. All right, then you'll take Gorgias under the Among the two, yeah, we, we split. <laughs> right? Okay, do it, right? So that's the responsible. Paul, which one do you think you see? Banquet. <laughs> <laughs> I might do this song. Oh. Well, Bill. Um, thank you. I think they'll probably leave us. Why not? Would you get burned? I guess I'm more interested in questions than the others. You can take the time you have to burn me. Of course, I like the 10th book of the Republic. All right, you take it. Oh, okay. I'm not familiar with that. The whole Hey, that's a good one. The whole pack. Carry is suggesting that we collectively consider kind of work that he's been in, the reflection that he's been partaking, and to suggest to him which one of these was most good. Um, <coughs> I think the Parmenides is most good. Oh, ruin it. Let's ruin it. Describe the Parmenides. That'll ruin him utterly. I like to fade on myself. You got it. Yeah. We'll get him out of the Maybe. mystical into the mathematical. Yeah, <laughs> All right. For a minute. All right. We'll, we'll take you away from the Orphix Once and you give you to the book. Seven chapters. We'll see why. You like analogy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Raj adjusted a break for coffee. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. You know the word priest and or whatever it is? I guess yeah. I'm yeah. the Greek would be easier. What's that? And it means, it's proigumenos. It means beforehand or or antecedently. It's almost as like before. Beforehand. Primary. Primary. How about primary? Getting the jump on it. Yeah, precede. Yes. Primary. 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 Your, uh, external apparatus. <laughs> 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 My external apparatus. So close to his. Uh, <laughs> My external apparatus. <laughs> All right. I missed it. It gets connected on it. That would have been interesting. I exactly how it's connected. It used to be. Uh, external apparatus. Good idea. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah.
two under my knee. Hey, Look how she's walking. <laughs> okay, what do you say we get a reader for seven? And then next week we can skip to six for those of you who like order. I'll read seven. Thank you. Yay. Yay. Good. Oh, um, you said sevens were how many kind of things? Drafted for the I, however, to an objection of this kind, shall make a just and perspicuous reply. I say then that Plato everywhere discourses about the gods agreeably to ancient rumor and to the nature of things. Sometimes, indeed, for the sake of the cause of things proposed, he reduces them to the principle <laughs> of the dogma. And then, as from a watchtower, contemplates the nature of the thing proposed. But sometimes, Me too. he establishes the theological science as the leading end. For the Phaedrus, this subject respects intelligible beauty and the participation of beauty pervading from thence through all things. And in the banquet, it respects the amatory order. But if it be necessary to survey in one platonic dialogue, the all-perfect whole and connected, extending as far that's a complete number of theology. I shall perhaps assert a paradox, and which will alone be apparent to our familiars. We are, however, to dare, since we have entered on such like arguments, and affirm against our opponents that the Parmenides and the mystic conceptions it contains will accomplish all you desire. For in this dialogue, all the divine genres proceed in order from the first cause and evince their mutual connection and dependence on each other. And those which are highest indeed conate with the one and of a primary nature are allotted a unical, occult, and simple form of hyparxis. But such as are last, are multiplied, are distributed into many parts, and are exuberant in number, but inferior <coughs> to power, excuse me, inferior in power, to such as are of a higher order, and such as are middle, according to a convenient proportion, and more composite than their causes, but more simple than their pro proper progeny. And in short, all the axioms of theological science appear in perfection in this dialogue, and all the divine orders are exhibited subsisting in connection, so that this is nothing else than the celebrated generation of the gods and the procession of every kind of being from the ineffable and unknown cause of wholes. The Parmenides, therefore, enkindles in the lovers of Plato the whole and perfect light of the theological science, but after this, the before mentioned dialogues distribute parts of the, mist of the mystic discipline throughout the gods, and all of them, as I may say, participate in divine wisdom and excite our spontaneous conceptions respecting the divine nature. And it is necessary to refer all the parts of this mystic discipline to these dialogues, and these again to the one and all perfect theory of the Parmenides. For thus, as it appears to me, we shall suspend the more imperfect from the perfect, the parts from the whole, and shall exhibit reasons assimilated to things, of which, according to the Platonic Timaeus, they are interpreters. <coughs> Such then is our answer to the objection which may be urged against us, and thus we refer the Platonic theory to the Parmenides, just as the Timaeus is acknowledged by all who are in the least degree intelligent to contain the whole science about nature. Two paragraphs. Wow. 
I'll read another one. Which one is your choice? I'll just take the next one. Four. Actually, he picks up the. You know, it's got a nice conclusion to the end. Yeah. Yeah, it is. it is. He's dealt with that first uh, challenge there. That was a good one. You're right. Now it's the second criticism. You know, the thing has a structure. It's worth looking at. Okay, let's do okay. seven and eight together. The structure appears in the page. <coughs> well, okay. Seven and eight, yeah. Well, it actually, yeah, okay. I, well, I thought it was a good plateau, but I appear, however, by these means to ex have excited for myself a twofold contest <laughs> against those who attempt to investigate the writings of Plato. And I see two sorts of persons who will oppose what has been said. <coughs> One of these does not think proper to explore any other design in the Parmenides than exercise through opposite arguments and to introduce in this dialogue a crowd. <coughs> a crowd. Oh, pardon me. That's crowd? Might be. <laughs> Let's go. It had a W over it. <laughs> yeah. A chord? I would have gone with that thing. <laughs> It introduce, yeah, it introduce a crow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Middle English Scottish. Typo. I'm sure it's it is. It's a Middle English W. Middle English typo. You got a dictionary for it? Middle English typo. A crow. Do you have the dictionary still? Uh, no. Let's take it as a typo. Okay. Uh, well, no, let's start uh, bringing a dictionary because uh, we wrote there's. It's worth checking. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a whole plethora of... Oh, you know what they mean? It's great. The crowd of arcane. This is eight, there's a plethora this is of 18, arcane, ineffable occult terms. Yes, 1805 English, right? Yeah. No, it's... it's, it's 1816 English. Right there. Okay. Um, usually a low cloud in middle English is a crowd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or to introduce in this dialogue a crowd of arcaded intellectual dogmas, which are foreign from its intention. Do you want to hear that objection again? One of these does not think it proper to explore any other design in the Parmenides than exercise through opposite arguments, or to introduce in this dialogue a court of arcane and intellectual dogmas, which are foreign from its intention. But the other sort, who are more venerable than these, and lovers of forms assert, that one of the hypotheses about is about the first God, another about the second God, and the whole of the intellectual nature, and a third about natures posterior to this, whether they are the more excellent genre. Genera. Is that a, it's really different. I've always said it is genre. It's genera. G E N R E is genre. G-E-N-R-E. -E. -E. Yeah. Is it? Okay. John genera. Is class. Genera are classes are kind. Well, that's the plural of it. Okay. Is that what you're saying? One French. This is Latin. But what's the difference? What's the difference? Is one plural and one this is singular? Man, this is plural also. Are they different in substance? Yes. What's the distinction? Uh, excellent. Uh, whether uh, they are more excellent genera. Uh, implies a uh, plurality. And uh, uh, it's just a different word with a different meaning. Genre is a particular class of it's which genera. there are many genres. As genera as or it's a literary term, too. Or genre. Or genre. Gen genera is a General. scientific or uh, philosophical. <coughs> is it a class? Cl it's classes. It's classes. So, so it's, a, it's, it's an ordering, it's ordering distinction. Right? Yes. As the opposite is specific, genera is general. Oh, is it to specific? That's the specific is sure? the opposite of general. General More generic general means it refers to many groups within the class. Mm -hmm. The specific you have a specific idea. Oh, I think the genre. generic is as he was pointing out. <coughs> literary modes. Yeah. Artistic modes as yeah. opposed to 
genus and genera, which are yeah. classic. Okay, yeah. I wouldn't have mentioned it except for it's yeah. been mispronounced seven times a week. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... Well, I wondered about genus. Genus distinction. Yeah. Yeah, that's why... Okay, that's why I understood it. Yeah, I think it's yeah. it. But I've been using the other pronunciation. Okay. <coughs> Whether they have a more excellent genera? Yes. Or, so, oh, okay, let me back up just a bit. But the other sort, who are more venerable than these and lovers of forms assert, that one of the hypotheses is about the first God, another about the second, and the whole of an intelligible nature, intellectual nature. And the third about the natures posterior to this, whether they are the more excellent genera or souls, or any other kind of beings. For the investigation of these particulars does not pertain to the present discourse. These, therefore, distribute three of the hypostases hypotheses after this manner. But they do not think proper to busy themselves about the multitude of gods, the intelligible and the intellectual genera, and the supermundane and the mundane natures, or to unfold all of these by division, or visibly explore them. For according to them, though Plato in the second <coughs> hypothesis treats of intellectual beings, yet the nature of intellect is one, simple and indivisible. Against both of these, therefore, we must contend who entertains that opinion of the Parmenides, which we have before mentioned. The contest, however, against these is not equal. But those who make the Parmenides a logical exercise are again attacked by those who embrace the divine mode of interpretation. All those who do not enfold the multitude of beings and the order of divine natures are indeed, as Homer says, in every respect venerable and skillful men. But yet for the sake of the Platonic philosophy, we must doubt against them. Following this, our leader, to the most holy and mystic truth. It is proper, likewise, to relate as far as contributes to our purpose what appears to us to be the truth respecting the hypotheses of the Parmenides. For thus, perhaps, by a reasoning process, we may embrace the whole theology of Plato. Wow. Now, I'll take that calling time. Yeah. Okay. That's a promise. Say, so, wherever we go next time, uh, everybody should at least do chapter 10. You know? <coughs> and uh, if you bring a particular dialogue that you singled out for yourself, that would be helpful, <coughs> as well as a copy of the <coughs> Okay? Okay. And the Republic of the Radio. Yeah, we can do. Yeah, let's just bring the screen complete the dialogue. Complete work. Dictionary. Just bring dictionary. I got an OLD I can bring. No, English dictionary. I mean, I have an OED I can bring. Okay. This is where I have an OED. Please explain the Bible lab. Oxford English dictionary. Oh, wow. Yeah, for the scene, we're going to talk about it. Yes, I can look at it. What is that sentence? Because. That's what Socrates says about Parmenides. Reverend and awful. Is that what it says? Yeah. yeah. We mean in the Theotetus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think it's we'll like it. that. It's we'll the same class. What, what was what was that? What that? Eidos. What is that? Well, don't you say that? Reverend and awful. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. What was it? You bet your wife. I bet my wife. You bet your wife. What up, Dad? You've got a day here. Your hair gets sick. You guys can't look at me. Where was it? You know? It's a pretty loose. I didn't know. In here? That's what he meant. That's what he meant.